she's one of the most recognizable women in the world. Sheryl Sandberg helped build Google Ads into a multi-billion dollar business. Then she did it again at Facebook. She's into her 10th year as the social network's COO, having made a giant dent in the cultural zeitgeist with her book, Lean In, a call to action for working women. Then in 2015, the unthinkable happened. Sandberg's husband, Dave Goldberg, CEO of SurveyMonkey, died suddenly after a heart incident. Heartbroken, Sandberg started writing again and published option B. Now she has a new call to action to companies and their leaders. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg and author of Lean In and now Option B. When you wrote your first public post about Dave's death, you shared some advice about how to approach someone who's going through something tragic. And you said, don't ask how you are, ask how are you today? So how are you today in this moment, two years later? You know, I realized um, after I lost Dave is how badly we deal with grief, how badly we deal with not just finding what we need for ourselves, but really supporting each other. I realized that before I lost Dave, I had no idea how to handle a colleague who was going through something hard. What I would usually do is try to address it once, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss, and then I would never mention it again. And after I lost Dave, I realized that even the basic pleasantries, how are you? To someone who just got diagnosed with cancer or lost a child, that can seem like a really insensitive question. Do you feel like he's still teaching you, maybe teaching all of us? Definitely. I mean, I try to remember what Dave would say. I try to remember um, the things, uh, the way he looked at things. It gets harder as the years go on. I mean, certainly as a parent, specific situations, when, he, when I first lost him, I was closer to those. And now I face more situations with my kids that I don't have his opinion. But then I try to remember that I know what he really cared about. I know what he cared about for me and my children, mm -hmm. our children. And I know what he cared about for people in the workplace. I've watched Sandra Lurie take on SurveyMonkey. I've watched them redefine their purpose around curiosity and how people use data to make decisions. I know how much Dave would like that. And I do remember being on your show is, a, is, a, is emotional for me because most of the time I ever saw you on your show was when I would watch him. How has it changed how you lead? It was something that really surprised me. I mean, I had thought about the fact that when you lose someone, you're sad or you're angry, the things people talk about. But what no one had ever talked about was the confidence loss. But then when it happened to me, it made sense. So when people said the kind of things to me that I used to say to people, which is, oh, of course you can't concentrate with all you're going through. In the days when I wanted to be at work, because being at home was horrific. Mm -hmm. Work was better once my kids went back to school. I had nothing else to do. Hearing, oh, of course you can concentrate, that really undercut my confidence even more. So now, I have a different approach. I, of course, start with, do you need time off? Mm -hmm. But if someone's choosing to be at work, I then will not just say, oh, of course you can concentrate, but say, thank you for that contribution. Even the most basic compliment can really help someone who's facing a personal crisis, facing a cancer diagnosis, struggling with something in their personal life because it tells them that you still think they can contribute. I know Facebook has increased paid family leave, bereavement leave as a result of this. How has this shaped Facebook's culture? Well, this is a really important conversation, not just for Facebook, but for all companies. I believe we need 21st century companies that make a 21st century commitment to employees. What does Pub that mean? Well, what it means is that our public policy in this country is in a really bad place. We're the only developed country in the world to not have maternity leave, the only one. You know, we're one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have paid family medical leave. Companies have an opportunity and an obligation to step into the gap. And what's important for companies to understand is this isn't a trade-off between the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. This is both. I actually believe it will create the kind of companies that will outperform in a globally competitive environment. Now, I know you've been quietly disseminating this philosophy around corporate openness and talking to other CEOs. What are you telling them? Let's start with the policy side. We need better corporate policies, parental leave, both maternal and paternal, covering all forms of adopting a child and childbirth equal for men and women. At Facebook, we offer four months, and we encourage people to take it. And Mark Zuckerberg set a great example himself. Paid family medical leave so that people can take care of themselves and children. And bereavement leave. 
I didn't think much about bereavement leave until I lost Dave. And Facebook had really good policies in place and we extended them even further. We now offer 20 days for someone who lost an immediate family member and 10 days for extended family members. I've been talking to a lot of CEOs and companies about extending their bereavement leave. MasterCard announced, and I was so happy to applaud them for it. SurveyMonkey, obviously close to my heart, have done it as well. And I'm hoping a lot more companies will step in and offer substantial and paid bereavement leave. It's hard to leave any job for a period of time, but tech moves so fast. Are people taking the leave? Are dads taking the leave that they're given here? We encourage dads to take the leave. I think one thing we do, which is a good policy, is we give those four months over the first year. And if you want to take it all up front as four months, that's great, and we're happy to encourage that. But some people actually have said, my mother or my mother-in-law is there for the first month. I want to do it a little bit later. So we're actually, one of the ways we encourage people to take the full leave is make even that leave really flexible. This idea of openness, what if you work at a car company or a consulting firm or a company in China where it might be more difficult to create that kind of culture? So I've been talking about emotion at work for a long time. <laughs> I wrote in Lean In that I cry <laughs> at work sometimes. That was reported as Sheryl Sandberg cries on Mark Zuckerberg's <laughs> shoulder, which is not exactly what happened. But I wrote um, long before Lean In that I leave work at 5.30 so I can be home for dinner with my kids. The concept that we can be both hopefully great leaders, great managers, great contributors, but also great parents and wives and husbands and fathers and mothers and friends. I don't think these things trade off. Mm. I think they go together. When you said you leave work at 5.30, someone else said you couldn't have gotten more publicity if you murdered someone with an axe. With an axe, exactly. <laughs> I think it's fair, though, that you probably don't leave work behind at 5.30. The expectations of modern workers and modern parents are higher than ever. How do employers address that? It's such a good point, because the expectations are higher on both sides. Mm. And you're right. I mean, when my parents were in the workforce early days, there was no internet. You couldn't work at home, and now we can. And so I'm not pretending that I leave work at 5.30 and don't pick up work again. Of course I do. But the ability to go home, have dinner with my kids, put them to bed, and then work, to get up before they wake up and then work, gives me the flexibility I need to be home. I think we need to communicate well with our employees. Not everything is an emergency. I do send emails late at night. I have a system with the people I work for. I'm like, if it's important and I need an answer to tonight or weekend, I will red flag it. If I don't red flag it, you can wait. And I want it set it up so that I can work the hours that make sense for me, but it's not forcing them to stay up after that late email to respond. One Uber investor told me he would die to have you in that spot. Why not? Tech companies have these amazing campuses. You never have to go home. Some people call it assisted living for millennials. <laughs> Facebook is, is one of those companies that you offer so much. I wonder, do you see a downside to that? A downside to the fact that you could sleep at the office if you wanted to. There's dinner, hackathons. Well, we try to offer things, but we don't require it. We offer dinner, but no one's required to come for dinner. And there are people who take their dinner in a box for their commute home or, or for when they get home. I think companies have an obligation to do what they can for employees. And that also means contractors. Mm -hmm. So we did something two years ago, which was, I think, a pretty unprecedented step, which is we announced that we were going to pay all, make sure all of our contractors who worked at companies of a certain size that we could have these deals with them get paid a minimum wage of $15 per hour in the United States and get paid leave. And that's something more companies can do. I recognize the margins we have and that we are able to do more. But I think almost all companies could stretch to do more for their employees and offer as much as they can. Again, I think this is the 21st century commitment we need to the people who work for us, and that includes contractors. The gig economy is changing the way we work, Uber drivers and all different kinds of more flexible work. How do we take care of those workers on a policy level? I think corporate leaders need to think about leave policies and pay policies, not just for their employees, but for their contractors. And we did that a few years ago, and I encourage other people to do it. Let's talk about public policy, right? Only country in the world, a developed country that doesn't offer paid maternity leave. Let's talk about family medical leave. There's a really good bill out there. It's the Family Act, uh, Senator Gillibrand and Congresswoman DeLauro. It's a good bill. It offers 12 weeks. It covers men and women. It offers substantial wage reimbursement and replacement, and it covers all forms of needing leave. 
That's the kind of public policy we need. There's some progress at the state level. Washington state last month became the fifth state to offer a really good paid leave policy. But I don't think we can fully rely on companies, even though mostly companies are watching this and I hope all of them do as much as they can. Right. Um, we need strong national policy. Apple built a brand spanking new campus with a 100,000 square foot gym, no childcare. Much was made of that in the press. Tech companies have never shied away from radical solutions to hard problems. Should companies with the resources of Apple and Facebook offer things like childcare? Childcare is often complicated in the sense that a lot of companies that offer it directly have long wait lists and a lot of places aren't zoned for it. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the option to do on-site childcare. So I've talked to a lot of companies who have different ways of dealing with it, but here's what every company should make sure is that employees are paid enough mm -hmm that they can afford good childcare, whether that childcare is offered on campus, which is obviously great if you can do it, or that childcare is offered elsewhere. Employees have the flexibility that when a child is sick, they're not worried about losing their jobs. And we know that in people who are employees of companies like Apple and Facebook, those companies are more likely to be able to provide those things than other companies. And that's why we need to think about all of the workers. I'm curious how the message of Option B and corporate openness aligns with the message of lean in. Sharing is great, but can sharing hurt women more? Let's be clear. There are double standards, I'm sure. On, I mean, men don't really cry in the office, but if they did, I would applaud them. But if you ever, people who've ever had a son and a daughter, I did, turns out those babies cry the same amount. As adults, women cry more than men. We, we socialize that. And I think our culture needs to change because we're holding both men and women back. I, really believe that the best leaders and managers do not shy away from emotion, but embrace it. Now, that doesn't mean we spend all day kumbayaing in a circle with tears. No one's saying that. But it does mean that when someone has lost a child, how are you today? I'm thinking of you. What can I do to help you? And on the way out of a meeting, are you sure you want to be here? But you know what? You made a great point. That is how you use EQ combined with IQ to be a great manager. I think the best managers are doing it, and more can. There's been an explosion of stories about sexual harassment in Silicon Valley. VCs have lost their jobs. The CEO of Uber has resigned. Are you surprised by this? I mean, I'm hugely disappointed. Look, sexual harassment has been around for a long time in every industry. It's abominable that it still exists in this day and age. People know better. I think it's great when people lose their jobs when it happens, because I think that is what will get people to not do it in the future. And I think this is a leadership challenge. Mm -hmm. As a leader of a company, there needs to be no tolerance for it. Full stop, no tolerance. Look, no one should go to work and face this. What's your advice to the next leader of Uber? I think people respond to what's tolerated and what's encouraged. And I think a great leader can change the culture of I think almost any company in almost any situation. You put in new policies, you have new procedures, your language is different. I'm always optimistic. One Uber investor told me he would die to have you in that spot, and I'm sure even more so after hearing that answer. Why not? Because I love Facebook. I really do, I love my job. I love our new mission about building community, and I love the community that is this company. I get to do something I deeply believe in with one of my best friends in the world, Mark Zuckerberg, all day. But there are a lot of great people out there who can lead Uber and lots of other companies in ways that don't just prevent sexual harassment, because that's a basic. We can do better. Part of the problem in tech is that it is still male dominated. Despite your leadership on this topic, has it been harder to change the ratio than you thought? Our numbers are still low. They're low for women, they're low for underrepresented minorities, and that's something that's a problem because it's hurting us. Diverse teams make better decisions. We are having some success on the business side of the company. Our company is more than half women on the business side, and I'm proud of that. On the tech side, it remains a struggle. And there are 16% of computer science graduates today that are women, compared to 35% in the 19, 1980s when the, the field was smaller, blacks and Hispanics are not represented in computer science. In order to hire computer scientists, we have to persuade more women and underrepresented minorities to go into computer science. We take that really seriously at Facebook. We have a large Facebook internship program and we hire people who are computer scientists of all backgrounds. We started going earlier in the program. We created Facebook University, tried to find women and underrepresented minorities who we thought 
could be great in computer science, but weren't yet in the field or were just starting in the field. So we could get them earlier and invest in them and try to keep them in. We have a very large computer science and engineering lean in circle program. We do it with LinkedIn and my foundation and Facebook, um, trying to get women to feel that they have peers right from the beginning. If you go to a computer science class, but you don't have enough women in there, well, if you can be in a lean in circle of computer scientists where you're seeing more women, and we need to do more because we're still not moving the numbers enough. I've heard you talk about how much you enjoy visiting lean in circles and hearing other women talk about the challenges they're taking on. What new challenges do you want to take on? I feel fully challenged. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, we try to do it by empowering local teams. We know we're not going to get everything right from Menlo Park. So with public policy, we've hired local teams on the ground. We have extraordinary leaders around the world, and they make sure we understand what's going on in those countries. We are not perfect. <laughs> with so many people posting to Facebook, we make mistakes. We're trying to address those mistakes quickly and correct them. We're also really investing in community operations. Mm -hmm. We're hiring another 3,000 people to work with our community. That's a pretty serious investment for us and hiring them all around the world. We want to try to get the policies right, get there quickly, and uh, make sure we're staffed so that can, we can be as responsive as possible. If Facebook is more like a government than a company, what's your role? Well, we're a company. <laughs> we're a company. We're a company that's broadly used. We have responsibility and deep responsibility to the people who use us to put out a product and service that enables them to share and keeps harmful things from happening. We have responsibility to the people that use our products. When they report something, we try to get to it as quickly as possible. And we have a responsibility to build teams around the world that have empathy for local users. And that's what we're trying to do. Facebook is pushing forward with artificial intelligence. You're hiring 3,000 people to help moderate content. Ultimately, someday though, this is a job technology might be able to do. What do you see as the impact of automation on the human worker? Automation's had very profound impacts for workers. And we know that, right? I mean, I am old enough to remember when you used to get money from a bank and when you used to check in with a person to an airline ticket. And so we see how automation is taking jobs that would have been done across lots of industries. Technology can also be used to grow jobs. So we have 70 million small businesses that use Facebook on a monthly basis. And we just announced that we have 15 million small businesses using Instagram on a monthly basis. These are mostly non-tech businesses that are using the power of technology to find their customers and build their businesses. We study our impact on the economy regularly, and we care about the millions of jobs that we create. And we work really hard to help small businesses use technology to help them thrive. And importantly, not just tech businesses, but all businesses. Facebook is making a huge push into video, and some say Facebook might become more like a competitor to YouTube. How do you hope this changes the perception of what Facebook is? It's really a technological advancement. Four years ago, if you tried to post a video, you couldn't. And if you tried to watch a video, it buffered, and it was super annoying. And today, video is exploding because the technology is there. And so what we're doing is making sure people can share and consume content in any way they want. And so video is an important part of that. Facebook has taken on many of Snapchat's most popular ideas. They say imitation is the highest form of flattery, but Evan Spiegel may not feel that way. Do you think there's room for another social network in the Facebook empire? Mobile time is exploding. People are using more and more mobile time. People are using more and more social time. I remember interviewing with Mark for this job almost 10 years ago and him saying that more things were going to be social. Well, that's what's happening. And there's certainly room for lots of companies to offer lots of great services. I've heard you talk about how much you enjoy visiting Lean In Circles and hearing other women talk about the challenges they're taking on. What new challenges do you want to take on? I feel fully challenged. <laughs> Facebook just hit 2 billion users around the world. We know how deep our responsibility is. And I love working with Mark and the team here on that. I'm glad I wrote Option B. It was a very emotional thing to do, but I think um, it was important. And if it helps just one person, then that gives Dave's life a little more meaning. And that has all the meaning in the world for me. Would you ever run for office? No. <laughs> <laughs> Staying at Facebook. Okay. <laughs> Got it. You've been here nine years. What are you most proud of? And what's one thing you still hope to do? I'm most proud of our teams around the world. The people I work with every day at Facebook believe in our mission. They work so hard to get it right. They correct when they need to. And they're building products that we're proud of. And I'm proud of them. And I'm grateful that I'm on this team. And I think there's a lot we still need to get right. We still need to build products and services that help people connect and share in really authentic ways. And we're going to continue working hard at that. All right, Cheryl Sandberg, Facebook COO, thank you so much for joining us.